Hi, this is the second of three videos reviewing general relativity in a bottom-up fashion. This video looks at the building blocks of space-time in three and four dimensions. We'll look at the Schwarzschild space-time and how time slows near the surface of a black hole. We'll also see how the flat space-time inside a spherical shell differs from the flat space-time far away. Let's get started. So far, we have looked at two-dimensional space. In two dimensions, the building blocks of space are pixels. And when space is flat, they're all the same size in a plane. But when space is curved, they either have to deform or buckle out in the third dimension. And we said that we'll stick with a viewpoint where they deform. Now let's look at three-dimensional space. The building blocks are now three-dimensional voxels instead of pixels. We'll picture them as little chunks of jello, transparent, so that we can see when things move in them or are in them. We can think of flat three-dimensional space as being a grid of cubical voxels. But even though they are transparent, it's difficult to see through them, so usually we show only one plane of voxels. Now the voxels will all be the same size if we measure them with a stick, one unit long in x, y, and z. And as before, curved space means that the voxels deform and that the sticks, which are made of minivoxels, deform right along. Now in the universe, masses are often spherical, so instead of a square grid, let's arrange our voxels like this. In this case, the mass is small, so we don't see any curvature. The voxels are all the same size and shape. Each ring is one unit long in the radial direction, and also one unit wide along the ring. Now let's do some simple algebra. You know, the circumference of a circle is 2 pi times the radius. We'll put four sticks along the radius from the center. The sphere itself has a radius of two units, and then each ring is another unit. So the middle of the innermost ring is located at two and a half units. The circumference then is five pi, or about 16. So we get 16 sticks around that ring. The next ring has a radius that is one unit bigger, and so we get six units more in circumference. So we get 22 sticks around that ring. We're still in flat space, and so good old geometry works just fine. But next, we're going to increase the density of the sphere, almost up to the point where it becomes a black hole. In general relativity, mass causes space to curve. So pay attention to the voxels, especially the innermost rings. As you can see, the voxels shrink, but only in the direction of the radius. Because the rings are now smaller, we don't fit as many voxels along them. For example, the innermost ring now has 14 voxels instead of 16 and the second ring has 16 voxels instead of 22. Now that's two more instead of six more. Why is this? Well, you can see that the rings are now closer together. The distance between them is only one third of what it was before. But, and here's the real important point. If we put a stick in the direction of the radius, it shrinks so that it just fits between the two rings. So if you had people living on these two rings, they'd measure that they are one unit apart, but that the circumference differs by only two units instead of six. This phenomenon is called excess radius. We measure more radius than we expect. Geometry doesn't work anymore. When this happens, we conclude that space is curved. This particular space-time, outside a spherically symmetric mass, is called a Schwarzschild space-time. It works for planets and stars and black holes as long as they don't rotate, and we'll come back to it soon. So far, we looked at curvature in two and three dimensions of space. We're finally ready to add the fourth dimension, which is time. Here we copy a voxel, pull it out, and connect the corners. The result is a hypervoxel, or a four-voxel. It's the building block of space-time. The size is one unit in each space dimension. And in the time dimension, we also measure one unit, for example, a nanosecond. 
but we let the stick have a different shape and color and sound. But the hypervoxel itself looks kind of messy. So to show a hypervoxel, we'll use some other styles. We can use the time of the video itself and let the voxel move as time goes by. This works in a video, but wouldn't work in a book. Sometimes it's easier to take a two-dimensional slice through space and the time point up in the old Z direction. When we do this, we use a clear white color for the hypervoxel as a reminder that one dimension is time. And of course, the stick that measures time can also deform. Now, when it comes to particle motion, we sometimes show only one dimensional space. And again, time can be video time. Or time can go upward in the Z direction, in which case a particle may leave a trail. Now let's go back to the Schwarzschild space-time, where not only space curves, but time also curves. What does it mean for time to curve? Well, out in space, far from the mass, clocks tick at a certain rate. But near a mass, clocks run in slow motion. Near the Earth, the effect is small, but big enough that the GPS satellites must take it into account. If they didn't, the map on your cell phone would get your location very wrong after just a few hours. Near a black hole, the effect can be as large as you like. Just outside the event horizon, the clock may take just one second, while a billion years go by out in space. Now, sometimes in relativity, when it appears that two things are different, it is just a side effect of the coordinate system and not a real physical effect. But in our case, it is a real physical effect. If, after some time, we take the two clocks and put them next to each other, we'll see that one of them does indeed lag behind. It has clocked less total time. Let's look at the voxels, but this time only along one radius. As before, these are space-only voxels in X, Y, and Z. But now let's get rid of Z. Let's make a slice in the equatorial plane. And then we let time run upward. The sphere in the center becomes a disk that sits still, so with time it looks like a cylinder. And the hypervoxels stretch in time, especially near the black hole. Remember that when we go from the bottom of a hypervoxel to the top, it's always one local unit of time, for example one second. Near the black hole, we can stack a couple of hypervoxels to get, for example, two units of local time. Far from the black hole, where the hypervoxels are less tall, we need to stack many more to get as high. In this case, it's six units of local time. And so, time runs faster far from the black hole. While we're still in Schwarzschild space-time, let's briefly look at the gravitational redshift and blue shift. If a clock far away sends out one light flash every second to another clock near the black hole, that second clock will receive two light flashes every local second. In other words, the frequency measured is higher. The light flashes are blue shifted at the second clock. And of course, in the other direction, light flashes are red shifted. What happens to the hypervoxels inside the spherical mass? Well, that depends on exactly how the mass is distributed. But in general, they stretch out both along the radius and in time. Now, there's a very interesting special case when all the mass is concentrated in a spherical shell, so there's a large hole in the center. In this case, inside the hole, space-time is flat. All the hypervoxels are the same size and shape. Inside the hole, you can float without being pulled by gravity in any direction. In other words, this grid of hypervoxels is similar to far away in empty space. But, and pay attention, because many people get this wrong, even in published papers, the two spacetimes are not identical. Inside the hole, the hypervoxels are taller in the time dimension, because clocks there do run more slowly than far away. So we have two regions of flat space-time, 
but they are flat in different ways. For example, you could compare clocks after a while, like we did before, and see that one runs behind. Or you could send flashes of light through a hole in the shell and get a frequency shift. Either way, you'll discover that time runs differently in the two flat regions. Clocks do not run at the same rate. Remember Pixel Man? We saw before that if everything doubles in size, you wouldn't notice. It's a kind of conspiracy of nature that if you and your stick and the things around you all double in size, it cancels out. The same thing happens with time. If everything runs in slow motion, including you, the neurons in your brain, your clock, and the speed of light, you wouldn't notice. Again, we have that conspiracy of nature where things cancel out locally. So, all these hypervoxels, deforming like jello, is it a metaphor? Is it real? Well, personally, I think it's a very useful way of thinking about space-time, and we'll see more examples soon in both relativity and quantum mechanics. Let me quote Anthony Z, who is a physicist. He writes, Space-time, with its warping and unwarping, is an elastic medium, just like a piece of jello is an elastic medium. The elasticity of jello reflects a deeper reality. In the next video, we look at slow light, how light bends, and how a breather accelerates towards slow light. I'll see you there. For more videos, go to physicsisnotweird.com. And I'm Aiden Bernander.